Tom Keen On Demand, presenting a bonus premium podcast, only available to subscribers. It's an after-the-show interview, no one else but Brad DeLong. Brad, how did you start your internet website? When you started grasping reality, I'm sure you had no idea what it would become. Well, give no. us a story behind it. Well, the story was I got out of the Treasury in 1995 when being in Washington was simply too depressing for someone who thought he was there to make good policy. And one of my ex-physics major friends said, well, he had have this thing called the World Wide Web and the archive kind of web repository in physics. And, you know, the internet is going to be the next big thing for academics in all disciplines, not just physics. And if you want to be a leading economist, you need to get on the bandwagon. And, you know, that was in the late 1990s. And that advice was from Paul Mendy. And I think it's the best piece of advice mm-hmm. I've ever had. When you work with your students at Berkeley and, you know, you know, as a prodigious teacher, do you see the kids today too much short term, not Twitter, but just, you know, they're out there blogging they're sort of reading pieces by Brad DeLong or Simon Johnson or Ken Rogoff just published minutes ago on Project Syndicate. Uh, Are they diving into the textbooks or are textbooks drifting off into the past? No, they're diving into the textbooks and they're trying, um... What's def what's definitely changed is the virtual hallway, right? Um, that Very is, good. It used to be that you would walk through to the department from place to place, and you know, occasionally you or the graduate students would run into somebody, and you'd have about three interesting conversations a day with people who would kind of compress what they were thinking into some kind of short, you know, um, and you'd learn something. Or you'd walk by another conversation in progress and you'd stop and listen. And what the Internet has really done is it's meant that the hallway has moved from outside the office into the office. And it's not just three conversations a day, it's 300, it's 600. Um, All people who you would love to have in the office next door all putting the things they would say to you in the hallway if they ran into you kind of online. Um, And this is, in some respects, wonderful, from some respects, terrifying, right? I was talking to Edmund Andrews, late of the New York Times yesterday, um, (laughs) who's trying to do a post-New York Times career, and he was saying, how can you possibly deal with this? That you can spend all of your time reading smarter people than you are, um, trying to say important things in comprehensible and easily accessible form, and never get anything else done. Um, there, there's a, a, a textbook I just run into, uh-huh. E.C. Prescott, out of London, uh, rather, on open economy, on open macroeconomics. And it starts, Brad along with history. And I was just thunderstruck. And here's a textbook that actually starts with a 45-page waltz through the history of mac- macroeconomics. You dovetail applied economics with economic history. Are we teaching enough economic history? I don't think so. Um, you know, that it was Charlie Calamiris who was saying last September that he found he was the enormous, or that he had enormous policy chops in Washington Republican circles in 2007, 2008, and 2009 because he could say, well, this is just like the Panic of 1873. Or I think the similarities with the Bank of England's operations in 1825 are worth um, considering here. Um, that he had a depth of historical background into what financial crises are and what happens when they occur, that everyone else who just had been running regressions on data from data streams starting in the second quarter of 1960 did not. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. Brad DeLong, thank you so much. From the University of California at Berkeley, it's an after-the-show interview. Thanks so much. This has been a bonus premium podcast. Tom Keen On Demand. Copyright 2010.